And I came out the other end completely convinced through all these interviews that 50% or more of the problem is us. And each of us has these triggers that lead us to jump in and we cause ourselves our own overload because we like accomplishment or we like to maintain status in a situation or we like to help or we're scared of what our peers think or you know fear of missing out. And it's those triggers far more often than somebody that can't delegate that gets people in trouble. This is the ERP Organizational Change Journal podcast, brought to you by Nestle & Associates, a Newport Beach, California-based ERP organizational change management firm serving the private equity industry. The ERP OCJ seeks to share expertise, insight, experience, and research, and to create effective conversation to help guide ERP organizational change to real, measurable, and verified success. And now, here's your ERP expert and host, the founder of Nestle & Associates, Dr. Jack Nestle. Jack here. Today we're going to dive into purpose-built networks and how this idea can be applied to a successful ERP outcome in your organization. On today's episode, we discuss ERP success and purpose-built networks with Mr. Rob Cross. Mr. Cross is an author, professor of global leadership, and chief research scientist. Rob has studied the underlying network dynamics of effective organizations and the collaborative practices of high performers for more than 20 years. He has written over 50 articles for Harvard Business Review, Sloan Management Review, California Management Review, Academy of Management, Executive and Organizational Dynamics. His work has been repeatedly featured in venues such as Business Week, Fortune, the Financial Times, Time Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, CIO Inc., and Fast Company. Rob also has three books, including Beyond Collaboration Overload, How to Work Smarter, Get Ahead, and Restore Your Well-Being, Driving Results Through Social Networks, How Top Organizations Leverage Networks for Performance and Growth, and The Hidden Power of Social Networks, Understanding How Work Really Gets Done in Organizations. The insight provided from Rob's work can have significant impact on ERP organizational change. Today, we will discuss many factors that promote ERP organizational change success, including organizational network analysis, efficient collaboration, organizational culture, innovation and trust, using networks to ensure alignment, collaborative dysfunction, and how small shifts and how we connect can have a big impact on organizations and much more. Joining us from Babson Park, Massachusetts. Welcome to the show, Rob. Please tell us more. Further introduce yourself to our listeners, please. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. I, so I'm a professor at, at uh, Babson College, which has been a fantastic move I made about three or four years ago. Babson is uh, a really welcoming school to applied research and, and engaging in research that really has impact in organizations. So professor there, but the bigger part of my role in many ways is I run this group called the Connected Commons. So that's a group that's grown to about 110 organizations that has been studying this idea of looking at networks analytically and understanding collaboration analytically for really over two decades now you know, and kind of applying those analytic based insights to thinking about things from you know large-scale organizational change or cultural change efforts all the way down to what creates an individual high performer or somebody that's happier uh, in their work by virtue of looking at the specific things they're getting uh, from collaboration and connections um, so that's a bulk of my job is spent really trying to generate the research and produce the tools and resources that that group is been using to advance thinking uh, on this front. And then uh, outside of that, I have a, a, a wife that I deeply care for and love. For 26 years, she's put up with me and uh, two children, a, a, a little girl, I say little girl, but she just graduated from Williams College and she's uh, now on a pre-med track and a son that's down in uh, Davidson College right now. That's cool, Rob. That's awesome. Thank you for the intro. Rob, I know with your research, your work, and your practice, it includes sharing ways in which organizational network analysis or ONA enables cultural change. In fact, you state in your blog how organizational change network analysis or ONA enables cultural change. You mentioned that, quote, most culture transformations begin top down, but culture is experienced locally in networks. More successful culture change efforts use organizational network analysis to drive diffusion of desired values and behaviors deep into organizations, end quote. 
in that case, ONA sounds like a pretty significant thing. Uh, clearly, Rob, you study organizational network analysis or ONA and social network analysis. Can you explain more about what that means exactly? Yeah, great question. So for me, it's it's been a way of mapping patterns of collaboration in organizations and really starting to understand who's interacting with whom, what kind of benefits they're getting from those exchanges, whether it's decision-making or career advice or interactions that are generating innovation or even interactions that are just consuming too much time, right? Or kind of absorbing uh, an organization. So there are various approaches that we use, uh, ranging from survey-based methodologies we've developed in the consortia, where people are spending about 10 to 15 minutes on an assessment that's not getting everybody they collaborate with, but it's getting the primary people uh, that they interact with. And you knit all those responses together and groups can range anywhere from a couple thousand up to 80, 90,000 if we're looking at large scale organizational changes. And it allows you to develop these analytic insights on patterns of collaboration. You know, these network diagrams that we can use to visualize uh, interactions and all sorts of other analytics that help us see where silos are, where people are overly connected, underconnected, you know, sorts of implications like that. And what we found in doing that or in using another approach called passive network analysis, which is usually around mining email or other things like that, not that you're ever opening an email or (laughs) seeing what people are talking about, but you're getting a sense of calendaring data or email or things that help you see in more aggregated forms who and how are people collaborating and at what times. And from a, a culture standpoint, that set of insights around being able to see these patterns of collaboration brings all sorts of great traction into how you look at and envision culture in organizations. So most often what people will do is they'll do a culture assessment and let's say that you know you you have an item that's measuring a certain value or a certain priority and you come up with a score of four out of a scale of five, right? And you think, okay, we're doing well. And maybe you dice that up by function or geography or level and just start to see are there certain areas that are a little bit lower on that dimension, certain areas a little bit higher. But with a network lens, you can take that same response and distribute it on the network. And you start to get really different insights. So for example, one of the things you find is in most cases, you actually don't have this average score of a four anywhere. (laughs) You end up with pockets of threes and fives. And so it really opens your eyes to saying, okay, we have certain pockets in this network that are really thriving and they're really embracing this value. They're really leaning into this priority. And then we have other pockets that are down in the three and two range. And if we can understand what the impediments are to those pockets, and remove those obstacles or help them emulate what's happening in the positives, we can enact change much more effectively than just seeing that average score of four, right? And some some distribution around it. Or another common thing you find is that some of the people that are most for a, a given effort or trajectory or priority, they're most positive on this, this value. And the people that are most negative, right? They believe, oh, we can't do this or, you know, I'm against this. Those oftentimes tend to be the people that are dead center in these networks, right? So you, you have um, the people that statistically you don't see it with average surveys, right? And averages, but suddenly you're able to see, gosh, I have these really critical positive influencers in these networks that if I can get them telling stories and kind of propagating change and how this thing can work. And then I have these negative influencers that if I could just understand what's holding them back, right? Or if I could just give resources or help lean in in certain ways that converts their voice, you're again going to get much more effective change in the organization. So tactically, what we can see is we can use these analytics to identify the um, culture carriers, the key influencers, and quite often they're not the formal leaders. And we, f- we find that if you use the network analytics to identify these key opinion leaders and then get them engaged in the change process early and diffusing the message out in certain ways, you're typically twice or sometimes three times more effective in communicating that change and getting engagement than if you just followed the formal structure. Um, so those are a couple of ways. That's really fascinating, Rob. And that's what I really appreciate from your work. That from a network lens, you get different perspectives regarding positive and negative influences. And I think that's a pretty powerful perspective, uh, quite frankly. Rob, you just mentioned tactics. You know, there's things you learn from this perspective. And you share in your work that if an organization wants to be high performing, they need to take action on trust, purpose, and energy. 
So how do you leverage organizational network analysis to do that exactly? That is, how do you use ONA to take tactical action? Yeah. So I got interested in the energy idea. I'll pull on one dimension of that. Um, literally about 23 years ago, it was one of the first network analyses we did. It was in one of the major blue chip consulting firms, and we were mapping uh, collaborations that had generated revenue across their entire Northeast region. So it was a big network analysis, and we were using it to understand, you know, how do they integrate the capabilities of this high blue chip organization to go to market better, right, to serve clients better. And it was one of the first places we decided we were going to use the network analytics to see what do high performers do? What is it about high performers in this firm that got very good talent? Are they distinguished by how smart they are, how much they use the technology around them, or their network? networks, right? And we could see very clearly that you could land in the bottom quadrant of performer if you were not, you know, using the right tools. But what got and kept you in the top quadrant of performer was having the right kind of network. And so I was just about to pull the trigger on this. I'll never forget it for as long as I live. And the head partner in the whole region stopped me and he said, Rob, we're all smart here. You know, and he kind of paused for a second. This place has a slight reputation for arrogance. So you kind of, you know, get that I, I, I Went with it. I said, yeah, you're smart. I'm happy to be here. But then he said, what I think distinguishes our high performers is not uh, a couple of points of IQ. But he said, it's people that create buzz or enthusiasm around them. And he said, they get the partners more on board with what they're up to. Their peers help them out and bring opportunities to them. Their teams give greater effort, come up with more innovative solutions. The clients want to buy more. Right. And all this has to do not with being slightly smarter, but with how they create energy or followership in the way they decide to collaborate with others. And sure enough, we just measured it as, you know, a network dimension around when you interact with some people, you walk away more enthused and other people can just suck the life out of you, <laughs> you know, even the most engaging things. And it turned out that being an energizer, being somebody that created energy at a higher level than others was about four times the predictor of a high performer in that context. And that's held for literally 23 years, almost at that level across over 300 organizations. We see that being an energizer is a very consistent predictor of where innovation is happening, where change is taking hold, where individual leaders are successful and continue to be successful. And what we've learned in this is in every single instance, myself or people on my team have gone behind these analytics to say, what do energizers think they're doing, the people that create it? behaviorally? And then what do the energized think is going on? And and what we've learned in all that is it's not personality. You know, you're likely to see an extrovert as an introvert, be a strong energizer, or a low key person or high charisma person, but it's very much tied up in a series of behaviors around people that, that see possibilities and situations that other people care about. The energizers use self-deprecating humor more frequently to take status out of situations. So there's a set of nine behaviors that that boils down to where the question for people um, is not, do they do this thing or not, but when they're under stress or pressure, which ones do they let slip, right? And so that's really how we're kind of pushing these ideas into practice is driving down into the behaviors of what are people doing that's creating this idea of energy in networks. So Rob, is it fair to say that maybe by definition of ONA or organizational network analysis, Am I defining this properly? Uh, and is it fair to say that it is really a method to map cooperation in order to better understand how to integrate capabilities so that we can see what high performers do? Absolutely. We use that all the time, you know, to go out and really map the patterns of collaboration and then get separate performance data from the organization, right? So we're never, ever, ever saying a bigger network is a good one. In fact, it turns out that's not the case. Unfortunately, that's what most of the self-help books do or the social media platforms suggest, but that's not accurate. We know that usually a big network oftentimes today leads to a derailing trap um, that, that can undermine careers. But what we focus then on is understanding very specifically how are high performers defined in terms of those companies' performance metrics or revenue production or patent counts or other things like that, and really looking to see how they're collaborating. And once you understand that, you can then begin to teach others that, right? It can become something that others learn how to do more successfully. So Rob, I would assume that there is some direct correlation between higher percentage of energizers, as you call them, and organizational performance in general. Yeah, what we find is certainly at a, all three levels, really, <laughs> that this idea of energy, and again, it's not celebrating everything, right? Sometimes people have this inaccurate 
perception that, oh, it's just being a cheerleader, right? And it's not the case at all. You're as likely to see an energizer disagree as you are to see a de-energizer disagree, but the energizer will do it differently, right? They'll say, you know, not not come back and say, that's a bad idea. We've tried this before, but they'll say, given where we're trying to go, here's an alternative. And so they're separating the critique from the person they're speaking with, and they're exposing their own thinking, right? And they get to the same outcome. So um, what we can see is really at all levels that it has played out at an organizational level, at a team level, if we're looking to see what are the networks of the more successful teams or units in an organization. And then certainly at an individual level, it is the single biggest predictor we've seen of high performers over 23 years, 300 organizations we've worked with, which to me is kind of cool. It's saying that having a good network isn't political or, you know, (laughs) or just being social. It's actually being somebody that attracts others to what you're up to. The idea is really fascinating, uh, this idea of managing the network. In fact, I know that in your work, you discuss the idea that perhaps many people don't consider, and that is the notion of managing the network. And it isn't just managing individuals or units, really, or teams, but you really need to consider managing the network. And you alluded to my next question, but to clarify for our listeners, why is this notion so important to organizational success? Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing more and more, especially at the team level, is that increasingly they're put on teams with very short life cycles, you know, very short sprints or scrums or (laughs) other things like that. And though the organizations hate to acknowledge it, it's very rare for people to be on one team anymore. Almost all of us are on five, six, seven collaborative efforts, right? Maybe only one is called a formal team that we're accountable for, but we have all these other side projects. And what that means is that the idea of what creates performance at these points of execution in organizations, we may be calling them teams, but they don't have the same amount of time to do the vision, mission, purpose, alignment, role clarity, that sort of thing. People are moving too quickly. Oftentimes these groups grow too large in many places to, you know, conform to conventional views of teams. And so what we've really studied is not looking at them as teams, but as networks that need to form inside and outside and specific points in those networks that create success. So, you know, we can see that there's eight drivers of team success at the network level. They tend to avoid having overload on a small set of people that's slowing the team down. Uh, They tend to enable inclusion more rapidly as people move on to the team. It's not just getting them on the team, but it's the way they help position those new people in networks that make them more successful. So there's um, eight of these things we know that matter internally. And I'll tell you the thing that really surprised me when we did all these work on the more successful leaders was that they are far more intentional and spend far more time shaping the ecosystem in which their team sits than the lesser performers. So, you know, this is really a big deal to me because if you look at all the models of what creates an effective team from the consulting firms, like 90% of the time is internal. Right. It's building your alignment and this and that. And if you go external, it's OK, you need to do stakeholder mapping. And what I could see when we did all these several hundred interviews with women and men that were performers is the more successful people are investing 40, 50 percent of their time in the external side. And they're doing six really specific things. They're shaping the nature of the work that's coming into the team. They're getting resources in different ways and they create a context that their team thrives in, you know, if they create that space and time. So those are some of the things that we see, you know, that it's more about managing those points in the network inside and outside the group that represents kind of the the quicker and, and more effective way of improving the outcome of the team today. Yeah. So on that topic, Rob, these energizers are good at shaping their ecosystem. And that reminds me of a couple of your blogs that I'm going to reference for my next uh, two or three questions And I I would really like to share uh, some of these ideas with our listeners. In your blog titled A Bra, Not a Ballet, you state that, quote, successful people are are typically 18 to 24 percent more efficient in collaboration than their peers. They reclaim this time almost a day a week by structuring their work differently, managing personal biases to collaborative work and engaging efficiently across collaboration platforms, end quote. Who wouldn't want to be 24% more efficient? So can you share more on how tactically successful people do this? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, this is the heart of my, the book I just put out called Beyond Collaboration Overload. And so I could spend the whole time <laughs> on this idea. So I'll try to, try to keep it concise here. But what we, uh, 
Well, I mean, basically what we found in studying the high performers was that was the thing that distinguished them. It wasn't a big network. It was the fact that they were more efficient in the networks that they had. And so that enabled them also to connect differently in ways that created unique innovations and scale over time. And so what I would do with this is I I use the analytics to see who are those people that are giving the greatest impact in networks and taking the least amount of time. And then I went out and interviewed initially 100 women and 100 men to see what are you doing that's in essence, you know, buying you back about a day a week uh, of time. And what I learned in that across, you know, that work and then a whole series of other studies is it's not one big thing. What the magic of these more efficient people is that they fight for the time uh, on the margin. And what they do is they put structure into their work differently. So they're more likely to block reflective time uh, to strategically calendar on Friday or Sunday night with a one week and, and three month interval roughly in mind, uh, they're more likely to manage interdependencies between roles before people are coming to them. But they do a a set of things that just put structure into their work. There are eight of these practices we talk about in the book. Then the second thing they do that really caught me off guard in the research is they're better able to see and spot when they're causing their own trouble in terms of overload. So what I had assumed coming into this collaborative overload work is that the enemy was out there. It was time zones, emails, you know, demanding clients and nasty bosses and that, you know, it was beyond our control. And I came out the other end completely convinced through all these interviews that 50% or more of the problem is us. And each of us has these triggers that lead us to jump in and we cause ourselves our own overload because we like accomplishment or we like to maintain status in a situation or we like to help or we're scared of what our peers think or, you know, fear of missing out. And it's those triggers far more often than somebody that can't delegate that gets people in trouble Uh, and learning to manage that, right? So for me, it's accomplishment. If I see five minutes of time, I will try to jam 60 minutes of stuff in it and completely ignore the two to three hours of emails and calls and things I have to do to get alignment around this crazy thing. And then I wonder for eight, 12 weeks in, how did I get overloaded again? Right. And, and the, the separation is such sometimes that I forget half the time that I was the one that caused it. So number two is they're better at that. They're better at understanding what's this trigger I have and how do I guard against it? And then three is just tactically. So you find, for example, that the more efficient collaborators, they don't look at email and say, I can't control all of email, so I'm not even going to try. They will look at email and say, you know what, my team generates 40% of what I have to deal with on a daily basis. And we can set some norms on that that'll steal back 5% of my time. So we can agree to bullets and not, you know, nine paragraph emails where somebody's trying to hide what they want in the eighth, or we can agree on when and how we're going to use it. And so that's what these people are doing, you know, is they, they tend to fight for this time on the margin by virtue of how they're putting structure into their work, how they're managing their own beliefs around collaboration that lead them to jump when they shouldn't. And then tactically, you know, how they're managing and setting norms around email or meetings or, you know, other kinds of patterns of modalities of collaboration in the organization. But the people that do this well, you know, they buy back time that enable them to invest very differently than, than people that are just allowing themselves to become a slave to the system. So Rob, I would like to revisit the idea we touched on earlier, and that is the idea of organizational culture and cultural change. Your article titled Spark Networks of Innovation with a Culture of Trust, you share that for innovation to happen, people need to feel safe to speak up, ask questions, admit that they don't know, and contribute ideas. And more effective leaders create cultures of trust to promote the collaboration and risk-taking needed to spark innovation. So how is this statement related to ONA and networks and what tactically do you need to do that is to create this network of trust? Yeah, yeah. So what we've done for many, many years is use network analysis to map especially two kinds of trust in organizations. So the first is competence-based trust, you know, people that trust that other people know enough of, of what they're doing that they would put their project in their hands. You know what I mean? They would ask their advice, they would listen to them and believe in their capability. And the second is benevolence-based trust. So people that believe their colleagues have their interests in mind. And we've done all sorts of modeling of this, and we know that both forms of trust really come into play when you are reaching out, especially to people that are not you're not very close to, right? People in other areas or uh, other functions or geographies. And that's usually, of course, where innovation happens, right? It's, it's those bridging ties uh, to, to other pockets of an organization. And so what we've really focused on in that piece of work was the actions that lead to competence-based trust can be very subtle. 
So you find, for example, the people that get trusted more quickly in networks, they don't come into a situation in, in a brainstorming session and people are you know, saying, well, we need X, Y, and Z done. And somebody just says, well, I can do that and expect everybody to trust them, right? The people that are more effective, they'll come in and say, well, gosh, here's a prototype of what I've done before around this idea. I wonder how it could be used here. And just by virtue of showing that evidence or saying, here's a case experience I've had and saying, how could it be done here? Suddenly the people in that group, they're not looking and saying, gosh, can we trust Rob? Does this person know what they're talking about? They're looking at that thing, the prototype, the experience, whatever it may be, and saying, how does this get used here? And so just that slight twist, suddenly those people have built, they bypass that whole year it may take to develop trust in me. <laughs> and they've, they've they get it focused on just the idea. And the same thing with benevolence. You know, we find that a ton of work we've done behind this on interviews is the people that create benevolence-based trust, they're more likely, for example, to get off task quickly and get a sense of who people are beyond work, what they care about in their work. You know, they just find ways to broaden the conversation, to give first and to do some other things that start to spark that. So, so that's really, you know, very specifically what we see organizations doing. They can use the network analytics to see where is trust breaking down right? It may be with certain levels of leadership or across certain functions, and then really focus in on, okay, is it competence-based trust? Is it benevolence-based trust? And just be far more tactical in the behaviors they're trying to build um, rather than, you know, go out and do some team building activity or trust fall that doesn't really kind of get to the, the heart of what you're trying to encourage there. Wow. Uh, pretty uh, simple ideas, but yeah, powerful. Yeah, it, it, it's always the small stuff, it seems, that <laughs> these people do well. <laughs> well, it's like you mentioned earlier, it really comes down to doing a lot of the little things consistently and good. Yeah. Rob, how can you leverage networks to be a quote unquote 10 percenter, as you discuss in one of your articles as well? And that article was The Secret of 10 Percenters, and we'll, we'll include this uh, in our show notes. You explain that, quote, people that score higher on measures of career satisfaction, well-being, and resilience develop specific connections inside and outside of their network. Proactively cultivating these relationships pays off in the form of physical health as well as experiencing greater growth, purpose, and resilience in life. Can you add to that? Yeah. So this was a really great push from the consortium. And it started about five, six, maybe seven years ago, where, you know, they, they all use the ideas we've developed around what high performers are doing, right? And understanding how they're collaborating in terms of building these ideas into change programs, into onboarding programs, leadership programs. But many of them, you know, came back at a certain point and said, we want to change the outcome to not performance, but to also be including measures of happiness, you know, and, and so we've, I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but we've measured it over these years as psychological well-being, thriving, resilience, career satisfaction, engagement, you know, a whole range of things to think about what creates somebody that's happier and is managing life in these incredibly demanding times to understand what they're doing through connections. And so what was interesting to me is the last 200 interviews I did, we were focusing on these relational drivers of well-being, right? How people manage connections that promote the odds of their physical health, how they manage connections that enable growth inside and outside uh, of the organization, uh, connections that yield a sense of purpose and meaning in our life, and then connections that create resilience you know, for us. And I got, you know, 20 great organizations to nominate five of their most successful women, five of their most successful men. So I was only talking to people that were conventionally successful, right? They were considered, you know, some of the real stars in the best organizations out there. And yet every single interview um, would start off with this facade of, oh, life is great and this and that. And then about 15 minutes in, you <laughs> get the real story, right, of how, how much they're struggling, right, with the demands that are on them and the lack of time for themselves and how everything in their life has kind of been taken away, typically by their late 30s, except for family and work and what that does. But then about one in 10 interviews would come in the door and they, they would say, nope, I'm living life more on my terms. Right. And, and they wouldn't say it that way, of course, but just the whole tenor of the uh, interview is completely different. And what I would find, you know, there's a lot of things that were unique about those people that I'm writing in a current book right now that I've, I've 
got under contract. But for example, one of the things I would see with them is they were far more likely to have at least two and usually three groups. They were a central or, or important part of outside of work. Right. And so these groups may be around athletic activities like tennis, running, cycling, swimming. Uh, they may be around, you know, intellectual pursuits like book clubs or poetry. They may be artistic like music. They could come from all sorts of walks of life. But what I would see is the people that did not let those groups fall away when life got busy, kind of mid to late 30s, but kept those groups alive. Then they just had greater dimensionality in their life. And they didn't experience the stress of work as much as those people that let them go. So I guess the only analogy I have is every, everybody's had the experience of, you know, going along in life and grumbling about what a pain everything is and why we didn't do this and that. And then something traumatic has happened, right? And you, you look back and you go, why did I care about any of that two minutes ago? <laughs> you know, with dramatic event. And I'm completely convinced these 10 percenters live that way. They live above all the minutia without the need for the trauma, right? They just kind of use this dimensionality, the other things they do to control their life more, and they just live differently. So they're a fantastic uh, group to kind of study and, and learn from, as we, especially as we, you know, go into this hybrid means of working more and more. That's a fascinating topic. Very interesting. But you said that about one in 10 people that you interviewed had that perspective? Right. And at the heart of it, you know, it really, if I had one thought for everybody listening, it's to be more proactive. Like we fall into this reactive postures today of thinking we have to respond to all requests, right? Or respond to things in a certain time frame, or to get involved in more and more activities is what a good parent does, right? And, and what you see with these people is they're much more likely to define success on their terms and and when you do that, it's crazy, the opportunities it opens up. The reality is we've never had more ability to shape what we do and who we do it with than today. But we give that up constantly. You know, we, we assume that we don't have control in situations. And these people are just more intentional, you know. And so one another example from an interview I did a couple of weeks ago, this woman had been a very successful marathon and 10K runner for 20, 30 years of her life, right? And she defined her existence as how she was doing on personal best times from race to race and a regiment that, you know, kept her focused on that. And she just woke up one day and said, you know, this is somebody else's idea of fun, right? You know, I'm, I'm running for these personal best times that nobody cares about, <laughs> you know, it's just a goal that I have out there. And she said, really what I want to be doing is I want to run with my child, their friend and that friend's parent. Right. And she started doing the same thing, right. You know, running for exercise, but with an objective to use that activity to pull her into some relationships in a more meaningful way. And she said it was a life-changing moment, right? Not to kind of rise to society's definition, but to be clear on what she wanted, you know, out of what she was doing. And that's what I find with these people. They're just more thoughtful and better able to look at a situation and say, here's what I'm willing to do, what I'm not willing to do, and not fall into the trap of, you know, subsuming to everybody else's ideas of fun. How exactly can you leverage networks to ensure alignment within your organization? Let me also ask another way, Rob. Um, mm -hmm. What has your ONA taught you about leveraging your network to endorse organizational alignment? Yeah, so when we look at networks uh, across large groups, right, in organizations, so we may look, for example, at the top 2,000, 10,000, or we may be focused on a certain new product development group that needs to work together that conventional teaming principles are not working with because it's a group of 60, 100, 150, you know, in life sciences, for example. We're never looking at those networks and saying that more connectivity is better. Right. If I typically if I had a live audience with your group right now and I asked how many people want another email meeting or phone call in their lives, there's no hands that shoot up <laughs> um, unless they're the, you know, the new people in the organization. But what we're looking for rather is to say, OK, what's the pattern of collaboration that needs to exist for this group to perform? right, or for this organization to strategically deliver innovation, they should be able to deliver scale efficiencies, they should be able to. And then we're comparing the existing pattern of connectivity against that desired pattern. And that's how we look at alignment, right? You're then looking to see, okay, where do we have overload happening? Maybe because decision rights haven't been well allocated or certain roles or pinch points in how things are getting done and it's driving excess connectivity at points that we need to push down. And then where do we have silos? you know, points either across functions, geography, or other areas where we need greater connectivity to deliver innovation or, or scale. 
Um, and so that's that's how we look at it when we when we're talking about alignment. All right, Rob, I want to refer to another article. <laughs> you had some great articles, but um, in an article called The Six Types of Collaborative Dysfunction and How Teams Can Do Better, you discuss how groups can morph into predictable patterns of collaboration that undermine performance if collaboration is not purposefully managed. More successful teams avoid or correct six common network patterns that cause lackluster performance or failure. Uh, and that, th that was a statement from your uh, blog. But you mentioned six key types. One is hub and spoke. Two is disenfranchised nodes. Three is misaligned nodes. Four is overwhelmed nodes. Five is isolated networks. And six is priority overload. So I know this is a loaded question and there's a lot here. And we will leave it up to our listeners to check out the full article. But can you share just one type and example of collaborative dysfunction that you share in this article? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, um, I, I guess the closest analogy I have of this work is many people are familiar with Lencioni's five dysfunctions of a team, right? And, and I kind of took that same idea and said, when these teams have underperformed, you know, and all the work we were looking at, uh, as mentioned earlier, we could see what are the positive predictors of team success and help emulate that. Then we took the reverse question and said, okay, when they've underperformed, what's the pattern look like and what's driving that? And so just to take one, the biggest thing we find right now is priority overload in terms of dysfunctions that are happening as we've moved into these agile structures. And you know, all these consulting firms have convinced organizations to target the hierarchy and the decision process and you know, reduce the effect of that, but then they've created these collaborative overload <laughs> in different ways that cause teams problems. So the priority overload one is really driven by too many disconnected and uncoordinated requests coming into teams from stakeholders that themselves aren't talking, right? These priorities coming in terms of sometimes three-dimensional matrices and other influential stakeholders that are allowed to reach into these teams and put work on them in a heartbeat. And it's a huge dilemma for leaders of these efforts because they've always risen by virtue of being good at what they do, saying yes, and suddenly they don't quite know, you know, what and where and how to prioritize. And so they oftentimes take on too much work, they distribute it into their team, and then you see this burnout spiral, right? It's both the amount of work that's coming into the teams and then the inability to get anything done to a level that people feel proud of. To me, that was one of the most difficult things to listen to as I went through all these interviews is you hear so many people talking, not about how they can be successful on something they're excited about, but how they're trying to figure out which balls they can afford to drop these days. And so that's the biggest one. And, and we, but we learned, you know, as I went through this research and we built it into this article and the toolkits that we built for the members, that there are a lot of subtle ways that leaders kind of deal with this. So one of my favorite was this very fiery uh, young woman that said, you know, I learned early on that I can't handle all these crazy people. There's no way my team can handle all these requests we're getting. So whenever any one of these stakeholders come to my team, I plot out this impact to effort grid, right? Where impact is <laughs> one axis and the amount of effort that has to be done to get this thing done is the other axis. And she said, if, if we end up with a project that this person's asking me to go do, that's low impact and high effort, we talk about it <laughs> and say, you know, how do we prioritize this or get it done differently? And she said that not only does pulling that thing out immediately, right? You can't wait until something is, you know, absorbed and the team's grumbling about it, but immediately in the moment, um, she said it changes the nature of a lot of the ask, but she said it even more importantly, all these stakeholders know that this crazy person's gonna pull out the impact effort grid whenever I come ask for stuff. And they think, about it. you know, they're like, maybe I don't need this. And so it, it creates a little bit of a, a, a discipline. And so there's, you know, five or 10 things like that, that we build into all these tools around here's, what you can do, yeah, you know, in terms of somebody that's on the ground facing this kind of problem today. And it is a real problem today. Overload is a real thing and it can have a significant impact if it is not well managed on individual and organizational performance. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. <laughs> Rob, I'm a big believer that consistently accomplishing the smaller things is critical. And I apologize, I forgot the article, but you shared how small shifts in how we connect and collaborate can bring big impact on individuals, teams, and organizations. Right. How so and how do you do that? Yeah, so the, the article is likely the one, the Harvard Business Review piece we did around, do you have a life outside of work? And that was geared towards all these interviews where I was asking people about times in their life when they were really thriving 
and happy and engaged and felt like they were just becoming who they were meant to be. And, and not what they were doing, but rather what the role of the connections were in their lives. And we found that, that four of these kinds of collaborations tended to occur at work. And so they would be interactions where you really believe in a culture or leaders and kind of lean into what they're trying to accomplish. Interactions where you are co-creating with your peers around, you know, either some new idea, some innovation, some new way the organization can run. Uh, interactions that are mentoring and giving back and interactions that that allow you to see the impact on the ultimate consumer uh, of what you're producing. And then there were sets of interactions outside of work, you know, that had to do with giving, um, that had to do with family, obviously, and had to do with being kind of parts of civic groups or activities uh, with others. And so what I'm always doing, this article ends with this model that has this, these sets of eight kinds of interactions in a circle around the center part of this grid. <laughs> and what I, what I found to be most impactful is to get people to think about how do they experience a more rich existence today, not by the big thing, not saying I'm going to go sail the ocean, right, or write a concerto, because we never get there, right? It's always just over the horizon. But rather, how do we take the existing things I'm doing and just shift them slightly to pull me into more of these spheres? So I gave you one example already of the runner, right, who said, you know what, it's that that personal best 10K time is somebody else's idea of fun. I want to shift what I'm doing just slightly. And it pulls me into, you know, more meaningful exchanges with my family and with a friend group that becomes a really important source of meaning to me over time. Um, I see other people do it. A, a one, you know, a woman decided how she was going to allocate her volunteer time, not to a big board that her company wanted her to do, but really to play a role in her, her children's school on a volunteer basis. Suddenly that decision is bringing her into more contact with her children. It's also bringing her in more contact with parents that are like-minded and share the same values, but that are coming from different walks of life. So she starts to get in these conversations that puts her own life in perspective, you know, a little bit differently. And I see the same kind of thing at work-related things. Like people just make slight shifts in the work they're doing to say, how do I involve people differently? How do we look at this a little bit differently to create something that has impact versus just checking a box? And those people, they just live differently, you know, by virtue of how they're leaning into the, the small moments, not, not waiting for the big moments. And I think this is a pretty powerful insight too. You know, how do we look at things differently? And can we look at things differently such that, we can use that to our advantage and to the advantage of others and those around you. You know, organizational network analysis or ONA uh, is a really cool tool because the network lens it helps you obtain different perspectives regarding positive and negative influences. Uh, and again, that's why I appreciate your work and what we wanted to share with our listeners. Rob, as fellow practitioners, we absolutely benefit from learning from our colleagues. And so I'm going to ask you a question that we love to ask all of our guests. Uh, and in fact, I think all of them so far. And that is, what advice can you leave uh, for our listeners and, and based on this conversation? And that is, if you had to distill your work and your research into three, four sentences, what would you tell our listeners? Yeah, to me, it's to be intentional about understanding the patterns of collaboration that are in existence or are required to execute the work that you want to get done. So we know the collaborative intensity of work has really dramatically risen over the past 10 to 15 years because of all the changes we've made in terms of delayering or matrix-based design, spans and layers, the new uh, technologies that have taken hold, you name it. Um, but too often our efforts to drive change are only intuitively leveraging our understanding of these networks. And we know that that's a mistake, right? We know that the more accurate you can be in understanding who your influencers are, where you're getting good utilization of talent, where you're not getting good utilization, where you're crossing silos, you'll have far more success. But it requires being really thoughtful and intentional about managing the networks and the collaborations more so you know, today and going forward than ever. Absolutely. Well said. Uh, good advice, Rob. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate your work. Um, can you share with our listeners where to find more information on how to contact you? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the uh, two two routes to me, one would be my website. It's uh, robcross.org and it's got a ton of information uh, based off the book we just released. I just released Beyond Collaboration Overload, but a lot of tools and things like that that people can go out and get a sense of, as well as really all the white papers we've talked through today. You can find the different blog posts or the white papers that are also on that site. And then the second for me would be uh, the consortia that I've been talking about. It's called the Connected Commons and that's connectedcommons.com. And that's, again, a great community of people just like you have here that are uh, kind of learning and sharing uh, ideas on, on how they're applying these, these thoughts today. Great. Thanks again, Rob. Be well, and we'll talk soon. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the ERP OCJ podcast. This podcast is intended as a forum to study, share, and discuss ERP organizational change successes and challenges. We discuss the people, process, and technological components of ERP organizational change by drawing on knowledge from extensive research, collaborative learning, and practitioner expertise and experience. We are incredibly grateful to have friends, colleagues, and mentors join us in our podcast as we seek to promote, connect, and foster relationships in the ERP organizational change community and contribute to its success by bringing research and practice closer together. We want to make sure this is the most useful and insightful ERP podcast you listen to, and we'd love your help in doing so by leaving us feedback and a review. A great place to do so is at Apple Podcasts. Just click on the Listen in Apple Podcasts link, then click Ratings and Reviews, and let us know your thoughts. You can get more info about the show, including show notes and episode highlights for this and all of our episodes by visiting nestleandassociates.com and clicking the podcast option. Please join us again next week as we discuss the latest ERP organizational change research, practice, and stories. And don't forget to follow us on social media, hashtag the ERP OCJ. Thanks again for listening. Have a fantastic week.